Hi, my name is Francisca Hartung. I'm a lecturer at Newcastle University. And today I'm going to show you one of my recent studies where we looked at the interrelation between well-being and reading. But before I want to start with my presentation, I want you to think about this question. Do you think, do you personally think that reading is good for you? And while giving this answer, did you think about fiction or narratives more generally? Or did you more think about like factual reading? While of course I can't do a live audience now, the majority of the times that I have asked this, almost everybody has thought about novels or stories, which is quite interesting. And the idea that stories or reading has benefits for your mental health, um, actually it goes back to at least into antiquity. This is the first time that we have recorded evidence that people were asking this question. And there is actually quite a little bit of um, correlational evidence that shows that um, avid readers are socially more skilled, meaning that they have higher scores on empathy questionnaires and perform better on theory of mind tasks. Avid readers also seem to be more happy and connected to their peers, so they have stronger social networks. And there's also some tentative evidence that short exposure to fiction or literature may prime social cognition and empathy. Though this is a little bit controversial because some people have not been able to replicate those findings. So we're not entirely sure how robust those are. The problem with all of those studies is that they are correlational only, meaning that it's almost impossible um, to obtain causal evidence, so we always have the hand on the egg problem that we don't know, but our avid readers are actually better at social aspects of life and are happier because of the because they're reading, or whether social and happy people are just more likely to read. But one avenue that we haven't explored to answer this question um, a lot is actually bibliotherapy. Bibliotherapy may offer an answer to this ancient question. Um, bibliotherapy is actually a therapeutic method that focuses on reading to create effective and behavioral changes. And it has an extremely long history um, in the treatment of mental health disorders, um, also in the rehabilitation of prisoners. Um, despite very sparse empirical evidence and systematic studies, because bibliotherapy is mostly um, clinical practice, a rehabilitation practice of practitioners who don't necessarily have an interest in publishing research because they're not necessarily academics. Um, but also interestingly, most bibliotherapy, like the few studies that are published on bibliotherapy, specifically focus on self-help books as a form to support um, therapy and recovery, whereas the actual empirical evidence and data that we have um, is mostly about narratives and not so much about self-help books, which is quite interesting. Um, there are multiple models of bibliotherapy, but the majority of them assume three stages of the effectiveness of bibliotherapy. The stages sometimes have different names, but essentially they all boil down to the same um, psychological processes. It always starts with identification, where the person who does the bibliotherapy is relating and empathizing with characters and essentially builds a connection with them. In a the second stage, sometimes called sympathy, sometimes called catharsis, um, we have a recognition of self relevance in the topics and challenges that the characters are experiencing. So we're bringing our own problems into the story world and we are recognizing patterns and similarities. Um, between our own problems and our own challenges and the challenges that the characters are facing. This can help us to understand them better or offer a new perspective onto our own problems. And the final stage, sometimes called autobiographical memory or insight, is when um, we actually then take the solutions and insight from the stories back and apply it to our own problems and our own world, and this is thought to promote change and personal growth. So in this study, we try to answer the question whether 
bibliotherapy can improve um, well-being in healthy adults. As assessed by standardized diagnostic measures, this was our quantitative aspect, um, and insight from participants, so we also had a qualitative um, component. I had a large team to help me conduct the study, um, where we tested over 100 people um, in two cohorts um, in multiple groups. Um, so we had uh, three undergraduates, uh, three postgraduate and six undergraduate students who were absolutely critical for the success of this project. And I'm extremely grateful that I had such a fantastic team. We designed a six week intervention with three testing groups. So the first group was the reading group with weekly group meetings. So classic um, book club therapy. We also had a control group that did the reading and the reflective assignments, but they didn't meet weekly. Instead, they um, just read the book in their own time and answered questions um, in online questionnaires, which were related to the prompts and discussions that we had in the meeting group. We also had a second control group, a creative writing group, that instead of consuming narratives, produced narratives and did creative writing exercises. And they also met weekly in order to do the writing exercises together and also had similar discussions that followed identical topics. We provided all the materials for the study. So the people who were in the reading group um, got um, provided with the books and the people in the writing group got a journal or a diary of their choice. The people in the reading group um, were randomly in both reading groups um, were assigned randomly to either a trauma fiction reading list or non-trauma fiction reading lists. And then throughout the entire intervention, they had to pick books from the list that they were originally assigned to. So they could read multiple books if they finished early, um, but they had to stay within the list. And this was because we also had hypothesis that the thematization of trauma in fiction may also have something to do with well-being. The entire study happened on Zoom online, so we never actually met with the participants. Um, this was to promote accessibility and um, keep attrition rates low or as low as possible. They were actually quite high. Um, we had two cohorts. Cohort one ran from um, November until January. Um, and cohort two ran from March, uh, ran from February until March. So we had one cohort that was interrupted by the Christmas break and one cohort that was over the springtime. The control group only existed in the second cohort because we initially just didn't think of that group, but we then thought it's essential to have a control group that doesn't meet, um, just to make sure that it's not the social aspect of meeting that drives the behavioral change or the social quality of life improvement. The cohorts were quite um, comparable um, and also the three groups were quite comparable. We had um, predominantly white women um, the creative writing group was a little bit more diverse than the two reading groups, um, but we had a really nice age range from 18 to in people's 50s. And in the reading group, um, a lot of groups actually went up until the 70s. So we had a quite broad range of people participating in the study. What we measured before and after the intervention um, were diagnostic questionnaires that are very typical to assess a person's health. So these are actually diagnostic questionnaires that doctors would use in a hospital to assess a patient's well-being. We measured depression symptoms, life satisfaction, anxiety, resilience. This is the ability to bounce back from adversity or challenge, um, state optimism, and also quality of life, which is a measurement by the World Health Organization um, that can be broken down into um, four subcomponents, namely physical, social, psychological, and envir environmental quality of life. But it also has two additional single question components. Um, one is about health satisfaction and the other one is regarding overall perceived quality of life. And then we also designed the activities that we would do with the groups and the themes around which the discussions should be focused so that we actually have a semi-structured discussion for all of the groups. In the first uh, meeting, um, 
everybody introduced their pseudonyms. We use pseudonyms to keep people's identity and assume meetings um, safe. So everybody picked their favorite fictional character. Um, and then Safford Beeblebrox, for example, explained to us why he picked that pseudonym for the intervention and then also used um, the pseudonym throughout the entire intervention as an identifier. Um, we also talked about expectations and previous experience with reading or writing and well-being. In week two, we went over first impression of the first uh, chosen books and easing into the story, so related to transportation and attention. Um, when people there were pointing out that they hated their book, we offered them to swap. They still couldn't swap the list, they would still have to be within the list, but we didn't force people to finish books um, that they didn't enjoy reading. We then moved on to characters, so how they relate to, to characters, whether they would identify with them. Um, in week four, we talked about narratives as information sources, like how different perspectives changes how we perceive the world and how writers have actually a lot of power um, in making us perceive the story world. Um, and then in, the, in one of the last weeks, we talked about internalized biases, how much bias and assumptions do we bring into a story and how um, and a reader's individual ideas about the world shape how they interact with a story. And in the last week, we talked about identity. Um, Together with the survey responses um, and the final survey where participants also gave general, general feedback how they benefited from the intervention, together with audio recordings of um, our online discussions um, and the survey responses that the control group submitted every week, um, this built the basis of our qualitative data. So this was the qualitative data that we analyzed. And the results are quite interesting. So for the creative writing group, we see increased um, life satisfaction as well as increased physical quality of life. For the reading group that met every week online, um, we see increased uh, resilience scores and increased state optimism. And interestingly, the group for which we see the most improvement and also the most relevant improvement for mental health is the control group, hence the group that did not meet online, that did not meet and had no social component to the intervention. Here we actually see a massive effect of decreased depression scores, so people improved on a depression and similar for anxiety. We also see a fairly, fairly relevant effect size for um, decrease of anxiety. We see also increased state optimism and that's not all of it yet, <laughs> I need two slides. Um, we also see increased health satisfaction and increased quality of life with um, the components, physical, environmental, and social quality of life being most prominent and the largest effect being social quality of life, which again is really interesting because there was no social component to this intervention for the control group. They, uh, this either means that they actually <laughs> Um, socialized with the characters and felt safer social, socially through reading, or that they got confidence um, through the reading intervention that then made them be more social in the real world. Um, I did not predict this, this was quite surprising that the control group of all improved the most, but I think it's really interesting. But before we go into the discussion, let's talk about the remaining results. Um, we also looked into trauma versus non-trauma fiction comparison, and there we see that trauma fiction decreased when non-trauma fiction increased health satisfaction, life satisfaction, and social quality of life. Resilience scores improved for both trauma fiction and non-trauma fiction, but more for non-trauma fiction. And this suggests that apart from resilience, non-trauma fiction seems to be more beneficial to well-being than trauma fiction. We also see, when we look at the reading experience, um, quite some interesting correlations. So for every book that participants finished, they filled in the story world absorption scale um, from Monique Alpes. And they also filled in um, some aesthetic measures regarding how they enjoyed the book and how they would rate the book. 
And here we see that higher scores on the attention scale, like how much people actually pay attention to the reading materials, um, correlates with more improvement on depression scores. And higher imagery, like how much people imagine characters and scenes, correlates with less improvement in depression scores and more improvement on resilience scores. We also see a nice link between transportation and plot-related emotions with better improvement on anxiety scores. So people who are um, really feeling pulled into the story and enjoying them and also then have a lot of plot-related emotions such as suspense and excitement, they benefit more for the anxiety symptoms. Now let's look at the qualitative data. Quite interestingly, self-reflection emerged as the primary and most significant theme with, almost, uh, with over 75% of all the assigned themes in the qualitative data um, being regarding self-reflection. Catharsis, on the other hand, which we originally hypothesized to be quite central, as in deprocessing emotions and then applying this to your own, own life, um, was surprisingly scarce in all the discussions and made only um, a little over 2.6% of all the qualitative data. Another theme that we um, didn't necessarily hypothesize about, but came up as an inductive theme um, during the data analysis is insight and learning. So a lot of people seem to be driven more by curiosity rather than escapism or motivations of topic interests. And finally, identification and empathy seem to be more prominent in the discussions and how people reflect about the stories um, than transportation and escapism. And we actually think that identification and empathy may be the main drivers um, for, for effective bibliotherapy and self-growth. Um, one of our participants, Astrid, actually had a really interesting um, thing to say that I will quote here. Um, she said, I think I take for granted that the characters are like me in some way. Even when they're unlikable or nonsensical, I'm always waiting for the way that they are like me to be revealed. And Aladdin also um, had a really nice related quote on insight, and how we learn about others. Um, we assume that everybody shares shares our own views and that these are the correct ones, rather than going into a story with a completely open mindset. This only comes with reading the book and understanding a different culture and viewpoint. As you can also see, um, we actually have very little relevant differences between the different uh, groups, like the control group, the reading and the writing group. It's more defined by overall contributions and overall expressions that were scored between groups um, rather than the actual topic. So we do confirm our mind hypothesis that reading and writing clearly contribute to well-being. What is a bit surprising is that the control group seems to have the most benefits compared to the other groups. And some of the explanations might be that um, making time to meet every week at the same time and actually Interacting socially with strangers may contribute to stress and as a result be less relaxing. Um, but the other reason which we also see um, when we look at the actual increase in writing or reading that the participants do is that the Zoom group had substantially more avid readers. So people who already read frequently are more likely to have the confidence to attend a book club, whereas people who maybe loved reading, but then just didn't read for a long time um, and are not very frequent readers now, they really enjoyed the control group and felt like this low stakes, low pressure environment was particularly useful for them. Um, but those people also tended to have higher scores in depression and anxiety. This was statistically significant. So the control group generally had poorer mental health than the group that met online before the intervention already. So it may be that the people who read frequently are already at ceiling for a lot of well-being measures, whereas the people who do not read frequently actually benefit much more from such an intervention. But it also really shows that the guidance aspect of actually having a therapist-led intervention and somebody 
guiding you through the reflection process and through the bibliotherapeutical stages is much less relevant for many people. And bibliotherapy does not need to be a formal structured intervention in order to be successful. So I think that's a large point for the cost effectiveness and the easy access of bibliotherapy for people. One really interesting finding is that trauma fiction seems to be less effective in improving well-being than non-trauma fiction. And this mostly opens questions. I don't think we have a good explanation for this yet. But one of them is that maybe enjoyment and escapism is more re relevant for well-being than the deep emotion processing aspect. Um, it may also just be that we just chose general trauma topics and that the trauma topics were not individually matched to a participant's struggles. This is of course very challenging to do on an empirical level, but on a clinical level, it may be relevant to find books for participants that are more targeted towards their individual needs. Um, and the last explanation, which I personally think is probably the most plausible one, <laughs> is that the trauma fiction aspect and processing trauma may need a longer timeline to produce measurable effects. So actually this autobiographical aspect and recovering from the catharsis aspect um, of bibliotherapy may take more than six weeks and may actually take some action and reflection on the participant side in order to actually produce measurable effects. So it may be better to look at a more longitudinal or longer longitudinal intervention um, to look at those aspects, maybe with matched trauma. Another interesting finding that we have is that imagination of a story decreases effectiveness of well-being apart from resilience. And it may be that just imagining traumatic events such as war scenes or characters in pain um, actually makes bad memories and bad associations and increases a person's suffering because they share, especially when somebody's very empathetic, they may share the suffering of the characters. The other explanation may be that too much imagination and being too vivid on the experiential part may actually hinder reflection. Um, as literature researchers, we know that uh, foregrounding actually um, promotes reflection because we get a little bit pulled out of the story and think more and reflect more about what uh, is supposed to be said, or we think more about the meaning of the text. Whereas if we just enjoy a, an easy read, we actually don't stop a lot to reflect. And this may, deter may be detrimental um, for bibliotherapy. And here it's really clear that more targeted research needs to be done um, in terms of trauma topics and how trauma topics um, may affect um, this link between reading and well-being. The takeaway message is that fiction is produce, uh, effective in producing positive well-being outcomes um, in bibliotherapy and that self-help and guidance books are not necessary to produce beneficial outcomes. And particularly, readers are probably more likely to finish an interesting book that they enjoy, and this may ultimately determine the success of an intervention. Um, because when participants actually stick to an intervention because they enjoy it, they may benefit more than um, if they are going for self-help books, which may be less enjoyable, but may give them more easy access to tools because they don't have to go for the deep self-reflection aspect. Um, I would recommend that future research needs to do a direct comparison between the two. But ultimately, I think it is safe to conclude that reading fun materials and experiencing joy um, are already successful at producing positive outcomes um, and we should probably invest in them. And this may actually be more important in trauma processing pending um, studies that look at longer periods of more matched trauma. So as impact, to my knowledge, this is the first study where we actually systematically compared different types of bibliotherapy 
and related intervention involving narratives. Um, the results suggest that different types of interventions may suggest um, benefits for different aspects of well-being. So we may want to go a more targeted route to match a person's needs to and wants <laughs> to um, an approach that fits them. But also, um, given that all of those interventions are effective in some way, um, Vivo therapy is a really easy, inexpensive, and accessible intervention for which people don't have to be months on waiting lists for, to receive mental health health care. Um, and they're really effective at promoting well-being and self-growth. And they can be also applied to a wider public. So we don't have to do them on an individual level. And I think it's really important to advocate that access to bibliotherapy and access to books, especially to vulnerable populations such as children, refugees, and prisoners is absolutely critical. I think also that bibliotherapy has quite a lot of potential to ease pressure on public health systems and support individuals that are waiting um, on mental health, to receive mental health support, because we all know that the waiting list can be quite long and challenging. So instead of just waiting, for things to get better, we could actually give people something to do. Um, I hope that you find the study results as interesting as I do, and I'm looking forward to talking to you at the Q&A session.